Hamilton House and Sayward Wheeler House in Southern Maine. Welcome and thank you all for joining us today and, and happy Pride Month. Uh, at Historic New England, we recently completed a reinterpretation of Sarah Orne Jewett House Museum to focus on Sarah Orne Jewett and specifically her decades long relationship uh, with Annie Field. So we're really excited for the program querying the past, the LGBTQ main oral history project. And we're really excited to have Dr. Wendy Chapkiss here with us today. Uh, for those of you uh, uh, who um, might be, uh, don't know, but um, Wendy Chapkiss is uh, a professor of sociology and women and gender studies at the University of Southern Maine. Uh, she's the author of numerous articles and three books, Beauty Secrets, Women and the Politics of Appearance, Live Sex Acts, Women Performing Erotic Labor, and Dying to Get High, Marijuana as Medicine. Uh, from 2016 through 2019, she served as faculty scholar for the Jean Byer Sampson Center for Diversity in Maine's LGBTQ plus collection. So please join me in welcoming uh, Wendy Chapkins. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with you all, if only virtually. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful to Marilyn Keith Daly and Claire Sadar and Historic New England for making this evening possible and for doing all the work that any of these kinds of events requires. One of my areas of teaching at the University of Southern Maine is gender and sexuality studies. And I found that my students have almost no knowledge of queer history. That's true even for LGBTQ students. They've had almost no exposure to the long history of the civil rights struggle in the US. Maybe they've heard of Stonewall, but they're often not precisely sure what it was all about. They're even more unfamiliar with the queer history of Maine. At best, they may be aware that gay people were recently given the right to marry, but most have no idea how long and challenging the process of obtaining basic civil rights has been. Most of them have no idea, for instance, that civil rights legislation to protect queer people from discrimination in employment and housing, credit and accommodation was first introduced in this state in 1977 and was presented before the legislature again and again and again and again, nine times until it finally passed both houses of the main legislature, but then it was immediately vetoed by Governor Jock McKernan. They also don't know that for another five years, queer people and their allies struggled to get a new anti-discrimination bill through the legislature until finally in 1997, both houses approved the legislation and then Governor Angus King signed the bill into law. Though that's not the end of the story, of course. The 1997 victory was sadly very short lived. A year later in 1998, the Christian right presented a people's veto referendum that repealed those basic rights with Maine earning the distinction of being the first place in the country to take rights away from a group that had fought and won them. In fact, it took another six years of organizing by the queer community to convince the legislature to once again add us to the Maine Human Rights Act. But this was followed by yet another battle against another people's veto referendum before we finally secured equal protection under the law in 2006. That means it took 28 years to pass basic anti-discrimination legislation to protect peer Queer people, queer people from being fired from their jobs or uh, refused um, uh, a rental accommodation. And of course, the struggle for equality was far from over in 2006. In 2009, the Maine legislature passed a marriage equality law, but once again, a citizen's veto launched by religious conservatives successfully repealed that right. It took another three years of organizing for the queer community to get a citizen's initiative supporting access to marriage for same-sex couples to pass in 2012. And still the battles were not over. Until very recently, Maine was one of the states that allowed the discredited practice of conversion therapy to be used on vulnerable gay youth. 
the practice which attempts to change the sexual orientation of minors from homosexual to heterosexual has been labeled a pseudoscience by every major medical and psychological association in the country. But it wasn't until 2018 that the Maine legislature passed a bill to ban the practice. Then Governor Paula Page immediately vetoed that bill. In fact, it took a change in governor in 2019 for the Maine legislature to once again pass legislation to ban conversion therapy. And that bill was signed into law by Governor Janet Mills. This year, the LGBTQ community has had to fight bills intended to erode the civil rights of transgender people in the state of Maine. In short, queer people in Maine weren't given our rights. We had to fight relentlessly to secure them for almost 50 years and counting. If my students are a good measure, and I actually think USM students are a pretty good representation of the people of Maine, that constant, fierce, often disheartening political struggle is almost invisible. It's certainly absent from the history books that are used in our schools. Under these conditions of historical erasure, it's crucial that we preserve this important history in the form of archival material. In 2016, I was given the extraordinary opportunity to help do precisely that when I was appointed the faculty scholar for the Jean Byer Sampson Center for Diversity in Maine's LGBTQ plus collection at the University of Southern Maine. The center is devoted to preserving the history of marginalized communities in Maine and was named after Jean Byers Sampson to honor her lifelong work for civil rights and civil liberties. Among other things, Jean Byers Sampson helped to found the central Maine branch of the NAACP, serving as its president in the 1960s. She also served on the Maine Advisory Committee for the US Civil Rights Commission. And in the 1970s, she worked as the executive director of the Maine Civil Liberties Union and was appointed to the University of Maine's Board of Trustees. In her role as the chair of the Board of Trustees in the 1970s, she helped advance LGBTQ equality in the state when she convinced the board to support the first so-called homosexual conference to be held at the University of Maine Orono. When this action led Governor McKernan to demand the board's res resignation, she led them in refusing to step down. The Sampson Center now includes three distinct collections, an African-American collection, a Judaica collection, and the largest of the three, the LGBTQ plus collection. When I was appointed the faculty scholar for the LGBTQ plus collection, I knew exactly what I wanted my focus to be. I would introduce students to queer history through primary archival documents, and I would train them to do oral histories to complement the existing material in special collections. In that capacity, over the past five years, I've introduced dozens and dozens and dozens of students to special collections, taught them oral history techniques, and I've matched them with members of the main LGBTQ community who shared their life stories. Audio and transcripts of those interviews can be found on the Queering the Past main LGBTQ oral history project website on the USM Digital Commons. Now, Technology gods willing, I'm gonna to try to show you some images and short video clips from that project. Oh, nope, sorry. Start at the beginning. There we go. This first image is student researchers at the University of Southern Maine working in special collections, looking through some of those primary documents I was telling you about. Special collections at USM contains not only documents, but also material cultural artifacts like t-shirts and buttons, posters and photographs. These materials are all available for the public to examine in person by appointment. You can go to usm.specialcollections at maine.edu and make an appointment to see materials. Or some of the materials have been digitized and you can find them online. 
including, for instance, the uh, photo collection of Annette Dragon, who was a photographer who documented gay activism and culture in Maine in the 1980s and 90s. This, for instance, is a photo by Annette Dragon of myself on the right and my friend and then colleague Hugh English on the left in the streets of Portland in 1998, trying to stop that first people's veto that would end up repealing our civil rights. When students hear me talk about how devastating it was to lose that special election, it's powerful for them. And their reactions to my story made clear to me the need for a formal oral history project to capture diverse voices from our community. There are now some 70 interviews available to be downloaded on the Queering the Past website. Each interview has a photo of the person interviewed, obviously their name, a short description of what they talk about in the interview, a way to play the audio of the interview, and a way to download a transcript to read the interview. These interviews have been downloaded from places across the United States and surprisingly to me around the world. Uh, I downloaded this map over a month ago and at that time, the interviews have been downloaded over 4,300 times. They've now been downloaded more than 4,500 times. And when I looked at it last, they had been downloaded in over the, just the past 30 days from places like the Philippines, New Zealand, Iceland, England, the Netherlands, and Germany. It's really astonishing to me to think that the voices of people of Maine are being heard around the world like this. To give you a better sense of the rich history that these interviews contain, I want to read you a few short excerpts from a couple of the interviews. The first one is an interview by Steve Bull. This was a, an interview conducted by student researchers Alana Larravee and Tracy Payne, and it was one of the very first that we did. Steve, now in his late 60s, was an early gay activist at the University of Maine Orono campus in the 1970s and was an organizer of that infamous conference that led the governor to ask for the resignation of members of the Board of Trustees, including Jean Byer Sampson. In his oral history interview, Steve remembers arriving on the Orono campus in 1973. I was sitting in the dining room, the main cafeteria, and Karen By walked in. Now with Karen, it was the flannel shirt, jeans, so many keys, like a janitor's key ring, clang, 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 horn-rimmed glasses, full-figured woman, just marches through. I mean, she drew attention. And my friend Judy said, that's the lesbian that's trying to start a group on campus. And I went, ooh, I like her. It's like, she doesn't take any shit. I got to work with her. People have to understand though, that especially for Karen, she was a lone person there for a while. And when I saw her walking through that cafeteria, I said, this woman's courageous. How could I go wrong working with her? Steve Bull and Karen Bai were among the co-founders of the Wildstein Student Organization at the University of Maine. Karen and a number of those other core activists have recently died. Of their death, Steve said, I was equally shocked at each. It was really just like a punch in the stomach. What we went through in the 70s was like baptism by fire. He told the student researchers that he worried that with their deaths, that history would disappear. I really appreciate this oral history work being done, he said, because I've been to like equality main dinners and stuff, and they talk about the beginning of the movement back in the 1980s, and I'm like, wait a minute, it was 10 years before that we did this and that, but there's no reason they should know that. Getting it on record is extremely gratifying. Steve's oral history also makes clear how much of that early activism was Maine homegrown, despite the occasional assumption that it must have been the work of homosexuals from away. As Steve noted, Karen grew up in Stonington. Her mom was the postmistress for that one little post office they had there. It was so funny because people don't expect that. After the conference, the one that he organized that led to the governor demanding the Board of Trustees all step down, I went on a speaking tour of campuses and in Farmington, this guy gets up and says, you're one of those people from New York City, aren't you? You're not from Maine. And I'm like, 
We were so mean. I mean, my dad's folks were potato farmers in Aroostook in the late 1700s. My mom grew up in Orono. It's like we were Maine, but people could not wrap their brains around that you could grow up in Maine and be gay. Lisa Bunker was the longtime program director at WMPG Radio before she left to write young adult fiction and to serve in the New Hampshire State Legislature. In her oral history interview with student researchers Molly Roberts and Jesse Lucas, she shared her coming out as trans. I was in my mid 40s, a couple of years out of a divorce after a 16 year marriage and with two kids. I was living in a double wide trailer in a trailer park in Wells, Maine, because that was what I could afford after the financial fallout at the end of a marriage. And I had my kids with me week on week off. And in the weeks that my kids were not with me, I found myself alone in a way that I hadn't been for decades with room to think and feel and write. I felt like I had no other choice in the world but to be a man, but I couldn't do it. I was failing and I was frustrated and angry and desperate. And finally, one night I was writing in a journal and I started exploring this idea of femininity. And I wrote something like, what if my inner child is a dreamy girl? I just wanna be a girl. So that was the beginning. And once I had written that and more stuff sort of working out that idea, I went and got some gym socks and rolled them up and stuck them under my shirt and made nipples out of Philbrook nuts. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I thought, yes, this. And then that was the start of a long process in educating myself and finding support. So about a year into my process, when I had sort of done the early work on my own, I came out to my sister when we were driving together somewhere. If you need to talk to somebody about something you're not sure they're gonna be comfortable with, it's great to catch them in a car because they can't get away from you. And I had rehearsed and thought about it. I was terribly nervous, you know, I was anxious. Coming out was like facing the fear that I somehow would be struck down for saying this thing that I had never been allowed to say. So I was terrified. We're driving in the car. There'd been a long, you know, easy silence. And so finally I take a breath. And I say, I have something to tell you. What, she says, you got a girlfriend? No, it's more complicated than that. And then I went through my little speech. I've learned something about myself. I think my identity is basically feminine. And it ended and we drove in silence for a while. And then, and this is actually one of my favorite moments in my whole gender saga. She said, this is amazing. If something this big can change for you this late in life, there's hope for me too. In their interview with student researchers, Erica Chadbourne and Kate Brezik, poet and essayist Lala Drew discussed the intersections of race, family trauma and sexuality. I'm adopted. I was born in Georgia, down there for six weeks in a foster home. And then I was flown up to Boston and my family came down and got me from gray. My family's white. The town I grew up in was pretty white. Most of the other black and brown folks that were there were also adoptees. Like there were 10 of us growing up in my school at its peak. So that was kind of hard. I've always felt sort of isolated. There was a lot of trauma and stuff in the house. So I would often go out in the woods and that's the way now that I re reconnect with myself. It sort of informs how I view the world through connectedness and which I tie into my queerness. Growing up in that area, having to turn inward and figure myself out, I think definitely affected the way I was able to access the things I do now. My dad, bless him, would always tell me, I don't care if they're black, white, red, yellow, purple, orange, or whatever, as long as you love them. And I was like, thanks dad but I'm recognizing all the different ways in which that's harmful and problematic. It's just, it's this thing that whiteness does where it tosses in all these absurdities to say that nothing is wrong when in fact it masks racism, even though it's coming from what I think is a very genuine, sweet kind of place. Like I was raised to be colorblind, like it didn't matter that I was black, but there's difference. You can't tell me that there's not a difference. 
I think me being an adoptee allowed me to have different questions with a lot of fluidity around my origin story. And having that fluidity around something so solidly linked to self allowed me to later sort of question sexuality. I don't know if I can specifically tell you my identity because I feel like there's so many parts of it and each of them show up in so many different ways. I find a lot of strength from being able to play around. At one point in my life, I wore stilettos and had long extensions and I wore little red dresses all the time. And in other parts of my life, I wore like polos and combat boots, all of those different iterations of self. Now I'm 30 and I sort of have a more solid idea of who I am and how I wanna show up. But those different selves, all those different selves help to teach me to be more fluid, less self-conscious of my body. I really like being visibly queer. It's scary sometimes in certain places, but I also think it's important to push back. When I was first coming out, I started to learn about what it actually means to be black and queer, living in Portland, living in Maine. I've gone through periods of being like, I can only date black and brown folks. And you know, that's really hard because there aren't a lot of black and brown folks here. I've had to really learn how to ask for what I need and to demand a certain level of things from people I'm dating and intimate with. J. Remy Dion was interviewed by student researchers Deja Paradis and Jonna Ossi. J. Remy Dion shared an experience of conversion therapy, which led to an effort to change that law in Maine. I had just turned 13 and I woke up with a profound and terrifying fear that I was gay. I went into the family room where my mother was always watching TV. I went in there in a state of terror, a sort of high pitched anxiety. I went in and I talked to her about it. We talked for a little bit. She woke my father up and we talked about it a little. And within a week, I was immersed in therapy to reroute my sexuality, something that continued for the next seven years. I saw about 50 therapists over the course of my teenage years to try to help me reroute my brain so that I would be heterosexual. It sucked a lot. At 14, I started a ritual for me that I still struggle with, a bathroom ritual of anywhere from one hour to two hours to four hours a day, where I would try to reroute and retrain my brain. I would visualize males and females and punish myself for desiring males and ensure I was attracted to females. By the time I was 21, I realized that I either needed to die or I needed to get help. I got help and finally came out as gay. Now I'd like queer youth to know that when they feel othered, when they feel scared, or when they feel kind of mistreated, to speak up. You have every right to feel safe and there should be no room for shame. Because I know that for me at 42, I've operated under such a profound level of shame that I'd like to make sure that doesn't happen for them. When I started to feel that I was gay, it became just another piece of evidence that I wasn't worth existing. We need to catch that in the moment. That's what you're doing with this oral history project. You're creating the opportunity for someone to tell their story and you're listening and you're documenting it. That's pretty cool. I was excited to come here today. It just feels good to know that no matter how my life has been, that it's a life worth sharing. It feels good to feel as if I'm valid, that I'm not more important than somebody else, but I'm not less important than somebody else. And I exist. One of the most important dimensions of this project for me is the process of sharing history across generations between community members and the student researchers who interview them. One of the student researchers, Jonna Ossie, shown in this picture, uh, attended a conference with me in Chester, England in the spring of 2019, where she talked about the importance of intergenerational dialogue. In that presentation, Jonna said, as a young queer person, I learned about the queer history of my own community through this project by working directly with queer elders. Doing oral history research can sometimes feel like stumbling upon a pile of old family journals and photo albums. All of a sudden, the place I live looks different to me. The empty lot at the corner of Forest and Cumberland becomes the 1970s gay bar where Penny Rich and her friends had to stop dancing and push the tables back together when the lights flash 
alerting them that the police were there. The small town of Agunquit becomes the place where Bunny and Sheila quietly raised a son and kept their romance a secret for 39 years. 1988 was the year my brother was born, but for me, it's now also the year that one of the men I interviewed was diagnosed with HIV. As Jonna suggests, in addition to creating an invaluable resource for the public and for future researchers, oral history research can be transformational for the students as well as for the storytellers. I'd like to show you a very short three minute video featuring some of those community members who shared their stories and the student, uh, student researchers who interviewed them. It was very interesting hearing the words out loud. Having lived it, you feel it, but when you have to think about it and, and put it into words, it makes you stop and think, did I really do that? Being interviewed was a, was a great experience. I mean, I was grateful that it was not on camera um, and it was, it was really relaxing that they, I think they come up with really great questions to ask. I wasn't so sure what I was getting into, but it was a joy and it was also a wonderful exercise for me to kind of ruminate over where I've been the last three, four decades and all the changes that we've seen in our lives. To talk with them in a way that was actually saying that whatever I've gone through was valid was really a pretty incredible experience. The way that they paced the questions allowed me to feel more comfortable um, and, um, and figuring out what, it, what, what stories I wanted to tell. Doing uh, oral history um, research is so important because it's, it's not only representing um, a, a slice of history, you know, but also the lived experiences of, you know, certain individuals in our community. It opened my eyes to my own personal biases, prejudices, um, and it showed me to be more empathetic and compassionate towards people. Interviewing people that are in different generations than me, I think, was probably one of the most powerful experiences that I've had. Um, there's so much history in Portland that I didn't even know about. I'm a student of the 18th century where everyone wrote tons and tons of letters and diaries. We do the, all that electronically or on the telephone now. So a uh, recorded oral history is going to be is going, going going to be of great value to future historians. Those of us who are in the LBGTQ communities have learned a lot, but I think one of the fundamental things we've learned is if you don't show up, if you're not visible, if you're not vocal, then um, the way things are won't change. The oral histories are going to be a story of what it was like to live as a gay person in our time and what we did about it. Hearing people who are on the front lines of Maine LGBTQ history for the last 30 years and being able to preserve those stories so that future community members and, and scholars can make use of them has been an absolute delight. And I really hope that we are able to continue to do this in years to come. I say yes. Share your story. Well, most of the oral history project has been focused on audio recordings. There is also a video and a visual component. In 2018, for, for example, I helped bring to USM the work of installation artist Macon Reed. Her piece, Eulogy for the Dyke Bar, examined the disappear disappearance of dyke bar culture in the US and served as the backdrop for an evening of storytelling by local residents. I'm gonna show you a short film now by Isabel Farrington that shows how the installation functioned 
both as a memorial for a lost dike space, but also as a venue for storytelling when it was uh, exhibited in Brooklyn, New York. In the old days, it was a place for us to be safe and to, to be with each other. We couldn't go to a restaurant and have coffee, a whole bunch of us, you know, we, we just couldn't do that. Going into San Francisco from the East Bay was going to the Lex and just being in that space and playing the jukebox and like being around like the shitty falling apart interior. There's a real sense of community there and a real sense of uh, welcoming various people into the community. It's a place for us to, you know, relax, let loose, be with our own people, you know, and just have a good time. <laughs> My name is Macon Reed and I'm an interdisciplinary artist who works primarily in sculpture and installation. I also do painting and drawing, video, um, radio documentary, and socially engaged art. So Eulogy for the Dyke Bar is a project I made that was trying to push people to really consider what it would mean to have these spaces, dyke and lesbian bars, actually not exist anymore, kind of be extinct. I feel like there are a bunch of different reasons for why dyke bars are closing. One is money, um, that if you have two women who are not making as much money um, as their male peers or whatever, you have less money in a community of queer women in general. So things like gentrification um, really impact queer women's spaces more. Assimilation is part of it, is that now that um, being queer is more and more accepted in mainstream society, we don't need to go just to the one queer bar anymore. Um, and I guess maybe with the internet, people are just learning to relate in different ways, period. So people can cruise in other places, they don't need to go to a physical space, have changed things a lot. Trans inclusion has been a really important thing for a lot of us in the queer community for a long time, and people are still kind of contending with what does it mean to have a space um, that's designated for women or for feminine spectrum people, um, and, and what does that mean for people who don't identify as that. Eulogy for the Dyke Bar works in two ways. Basically, the space is empty on its own for people to come into during gallery hours. It's set up as more of a eulogy and more of memorializing these spaces so people can contemplate in a quiet way what it means that they are closing. I basically painted all the walls to look like kind of 70s era, the way that dive bars used to look, and I built a pool table out of cardboard and joint compound. <laughs> this is also, it's like, it's basically it's a wood structure that then has cardboard. There's wood on the top, but the rest is all cardboard. Um, and there's a wall of archival images um, that I got from the Lesbian History Archives that includes letters from bars closing in past and present. So I have things like this, which is a letter written from the owners of Bonnie and Clyde's, which was a, um, a dyke bar or discotheque that uh, served primarily women of color for a long time. And they're basically explaining to their patrons why they're closing. It's a letter of apology. And I have that next to um, this one that was a Facebook post from Lila, who owned the Lexington bar in San Francisco for, I believe, 18 years. And so she's basically apologizing to her clientele and talking about why she closed. And when you look at them, you see that there's a really similar issue of money and gentrification happening. I particularly like started doing installation in the last couple of years because you actually get to really like build a whole world where things can happen and um, and like I always like painting the walls and just really completely transforming the space because I feel like it helps people enter into a different space better. And then during our closing night, we had Queer Memoir here and we hosted a set of performances and storytelling that basically the bar came alive. We had bartenders serving drinks, um, a DJ playing music, all of the things that would be happening if the bar were actually a functioning bar. Oh, oh. You just pick a gay ass drink. Oh, I a bus driver with white wine. And <laughs> Something else that's been really important to me with Eulogy for the Dyke Bar is um, 
that it be a place of healing um, and sort of reconciliation between people who might not understand each other. So I really wanted to make this space feel safe and good for people. And I was so thrilled on our um, closing night when we had a lot of different people and a lot of different ages in here talking about their experiences. I, um, it meant a lot to me. I feel like I'm, I'm really sad about how queers are talking to each other. Um, on the internet, people tear each other up. Um, there's not a lot of room for learning and growing in, in sort of what feels like a bullying call-out culture. And then also, we absolutely need to stand up and be in solidarity with people who need us. So it's, I've been really frustrated by that, and it, particularly in the way that it seems to divide queers along generations. I want to know older dykes. I want to know older everybody. I was so in love with how the the night went when we had Queer Memoir do their storytelling here and we got to have the different generations in the same room. We had queers up into their 70s and 80s um, talking and performing and um, something really magical happened there. All right, I would talk about my experiences in dyke bars, but I was mostly too drunk to have experiences. <laughs> there was no okay Cupid in 1970. You walk in and it's like a regular bar, right? And then you keep walking straight and there's this big black door. And when you opened it up, it was like walking into fucking lesbian heaven. <laughs> I came of age upon the alcohol-soaked floors and within the walls and halls of dyke bars. That's where American art was born, and that's where the lesbians lived. The reason there are no dyke bars left in the village, except for the Cubby O and Henrietta Hudson, is because of the rents. There are no people left in the village. <laughs> You couldn't dress like this any, you know, like the way you guys are dressed today. You couldn't have dressed back then. You would have been arrested uh, immediately for, I can I never... Sexual deviancy. Sexual deviancy. I know everyone I talked to really felt like they were getting something they really needed, and we rarely get to hear elders talk about their experiences. It makes my heart jump to see all of your faces and, you know, and how beautiful a community we have, you know. Uh, yeah, I just love this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>I think a lot of young people who came here really, from my understanding, were, um, were really just more moved by thinking about the question of where we're at and where are we going. Even though it was called eulogy and we were kind of acknowledging that shift and the loss, I think there was also a real sense of renewed interest and pride people were having talking about things and that was really exciting for me. Again, I didn't want people to go away with a certain sort of prescripted thought or, or feeling, but I just wanted them to leave with a lot of questions and to know that this is happening. And also, I think meeting older older queers and older dykes in particular gave them this sort of inspiration to be like, oh, these places really are important. that I knew are closed, except for Stonewall. I think Stonewall is still around, but uh, all the other bars are, are gone, you know, that I know. Many of the places which held the honorable title of Dyke Bar have closed their doors. Knowing that artifacts cannot speak, but are frequently spoken for, I do not wish to be an artifact.
when we brought uh, Make and Read's installation to the USM campus, it was in the campus center. And again, people could come and just look at the uh, documentary materials that were on the walls, uh, look at the installation. But we also had one evening of storytelling by local people talking about the gay bars and dyke bars that used to exist but no longer exist in Maine. Uh, this, for example, is uh, Jennifer Harvey, who grew up in Sanford, talking about coming out as a self-defined transsexual in the 1970s and becoming a homeless youth in Portland, Maine. Jennifer describes finding safety and community in the uh, Rollins Bar, which was one of the first bars in Maine. This video of the local version of the storytelling will be available uh, on the Querying the Past website at some point. I want to end with uh, just one more piece of the oral history project. This is a documentary that we're doing about uh, gay bars in Maine. It's called Through the Dooryard uh, Queer, Maine Queer Bars, and it was uh, done by Maine filmmaker Betsy Carson. Um, it builds on many hours of oral history footage, and this is a one minute trailer for that project. My brother took me out to the underground the first time, and I was I was like engaged to be married to a guy. Sisters, to me, was my safe haven. Not only was I underage, I was far from home, and I had never seen so many lesbians in my life. And this is where I came out at 17. It was really scary just to go into a gay bar. I rang the buzzer, and the windows slid open, and there was a little delay, and I thought maybe I should go, but no, it, the door opened. I walked in. And I felt like I was rocketed back 20 years. I grab the shopping cart and I haul it into the bar with me. And I'm walking around going, I'm shopping for a man. I had my first lesbian kiss there. Um, got a standing ovation, in fact. Shirts were off and there were the go-go boxes and there was the cage and, and the music. The music was what that space was all about. My life changed after one happy hour at the underground. So, as you can see, I hope from this presentation, there is so much rich LGBTQ history in the state of Maine. I very much encourage you to go to the Queering the Past website and explore the interviews uh, and find out more about this really remarkable community. And if you want to tell your life story, if you want to be an oral history participant, please email me. My uh, email address is chapkis at maine.edu. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation and we'll have a little bit of time now for some questions if you have any. Yes, thank you, Dr. Chapkis. That was a really fascinating moving portrait of the community in Maine. Um, so I wanna remind everyone, if you have questions, we put them in the, the Q&A and then I will relay them on to uh, Dr. Chapkis. Um, so uh, one thing that kind of struck me at the uh, end of the, the Dyke Bar um, presentation was um, the, the state of the community and, and where it's going. So where do you see the state of the community in Maine, um, the LGBT community in Maine um, right now? And where do you think it's going? Oh my, that's, that's a big question. Where do I think it's... Well, where I think it is right now is... Um, a very healthy, vibrant, diverse community, uh, but one that is increasingly losing designated LGBTQ spaces. Mm -hmm. We've lost, you know, it's, it's of course problematic when all of your LGBTQ spaces are alcohol um, focused. So it's, it's a problem that, that they were mostly gay bars. But when I moved to Maine 25 years ago, 
there were probably five uh, gay bars in just Portland. And now there's one, Blackstone's is the only uh, explicitly gay, gay bar left. So it's harder for people to find each other. I know somebody, I think it was Macon Reed in the, in the video about uh, her piece, Eulogy for the Dyke Bar, talked about the role that assimilation and broader acceptance plays in the loss of these queer spaces. And that's certainly true that um, there's very few spaces in Portland where I think um, I would be actively at risk of being harassed or, or, or queer bashed if I went into them. But I do know that if I were looking to have some sort of um, I was looking to to flirt with somebody and I went into many bars that were mixed, I might very much insult somebody by flirting with them when they didn't consider themselves queer. So I think there's still very much a need for for explicitly queer space. And fortunately, Portland is um, moving in the direction of having an explicit uh, LGBTQ community center, the mm. Equality Community Center. And uh, so I think in the next few years, that will allow people to come together for cultural and political and uh, just community building reasons uh, outside of a bar structure. And I'm very much hoping that some of the gay bars like Blackstone survives um, so that we do have also LGBTQ queer commercial space. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the the um, community in Maine as differing from communities and, and other places around the country. I mean, uh, it, you mentioned that, uh, or one of the interviewees mentioned that they uh, were told that they must come from New York City because, you know, they're, they were queer. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, how, how is the, the main LGBTQ community unique um and, you know in how it, how does it differ from a big place like new york city which has a really well-known um community and it's been the focus of, along with san francisco of the, the kind of history of lgbtq spaces in the u.s but how how is maine different from that well it's certainly true that it's different than a city like new york one of the people we interviewed chris o'connor for the bar stories film um talked about moving to Maine from New York and uh, going to, I think it was somewhere over the rainbow at the time. And it was a piano bar and he went, it walked in and there was a group of men, you know, hanging out, singing show tunes and playing piano. And he, he thought, okay, this is the community I've moved to. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, I came from a place where I could go to a different bar every night and I would see a different group of men every night and it would, you know, and, and this was going to be the community. Uh, but in fact, um, I have lived here 25 years and I find I go to uh, queer cultural things and I think, who are all these people? I don't know any of them. So it's not, it's not that small of a city, uh, but it is small enough that I think it's really quite possible to find and create community here. People do. Um, I also think it's a community in transition for good and for bad. I mean, some uh, ways uh, that it's changing are really problematic, like uh, incredible gentrification where people cannot afford to live in Portland anymore. Uh, that's forcing a lot of people out of town. But it's also becoming much more uh, international and much more racially diverse. Uh, mm -hmm. To get back to Lala Drew's comment that they couldn't find, you know, there wasn't a big pool of partners uh, if they wanted to date other people of color. I think that is gradually changing as there's um, more immigration into Southern Maine. Mm -hmm. So I, and that is something for me that's absolutely delightful. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I, Marisa, go ahead. Uh, I was interested in the, in this, the, the student interviewers. And so our students, uh, is this a program they apply to? And how, how does the process work for them to to be connected with a with an interviewee, it's kind of um, a surprise that they find themselves in this position because the way that I t I have recruited student researchers is I teach a required uh, qualitative research methods class mm -hmm. in sociology that cross lists as an applied LGBTQ history class in women and gender studies. 
So the women and gender studies students know what they're getting into. The sociology students are like, what? <laughs> mm. I mean, um, and they rise to the occasion, every single one of them. Uh, mm. You know, you saw uh, Richard Moran in the little clip about students talking about doing these oral histories. And he was like, oh my God, you know, I, I'm going to be interviewing uh, gay people and, and, you know, I'm not gay and how is that going to work? And they all, without exception, all I think rise to the occasion. Um, so that's how that's how the researchers are found. Uh, I do also work closely with student research assistants, like John Ossie worked with me for two years, and um, she is part of the LGBTQ com community. So she was really helpful, I think, in um, helping other students who might not have been as familiar uh, through the process. Okay. Um, so we have a question from the audience. Um, Nancy Gish asks, what extent do you think uh, the University of Southern Maine's Women and Gender Studies has helped make any of the pr progress of change in the LGD LGBTQ community and their acceptance in Maine possible? Well, I can't say enough good things about the Women and Gender Studies program at the University of Southern Maine. It was the first in the state, uh, mm -hmm. the first uh, Women and Gender Studies program. Uh, it is the uh, it is vibrant. It has amazing student population, fabulous faculty, and uh, since I joined the faculty 25 years ago, there has always been um, not only a welcoming to the LGBTQ community, but also a focus on that community. Certainly in my classes, but in some of my colleagues' classes as well. So I often think that we are introducing another generation to, uh, to this history that I'm sure for some of the people who are watching this video, that history was a surprise. It's like, it took 28 years to get a basic anti-discrimination law passed. How is that possible? Or that it was 2018 when we considered whether or not we should be forcing kids to try to change their sexual orientation. So um, in those women and gender studies classes, we do a lot of that initial work introducing students to to queer history mm -hmm. yeah. so uh i think a great question to to end on would be um what it, what is your a favorite part of the oral histories that you've collected or what is the most surprising thing what's a highlight from the collection oh my god there are so many surprises i mean i've only been here 25 years so for me uh it was absolutely amazing to find out all of the work that had been done in the 1970s, for instance, and the 1980s, uh, that I, I was entering a community that had a very vibrant, very active um, queer community throughout the period that I had been alive. Um, and I think that was in some way initially surprising for me because I thought of Maine as sort of um, well, I had come from California, for goodness sakes. I came from the San Francisco Bay Area. And, mm. you know, and I came here and thought, oh, these people know what they're doing. These people know how to organize. And they've been doing it a long time. So that was, that was really, uh, that's been an incredible experience for me over the five years that I've been doing this work. Mm 